and today I'm going to talk about um, unit testing in Haskell. Um, so, a couple of words about the structure of the talk. So, first I will talk about unit testing in general, and then I will um, talk about the library I was working on recently. So, if you feel bored, just wait for the second part. Um, okay, first, I really have to say this because it's recorded. Um, the library I will be talking about is not an official Google product, and all the snippets of code you will see in the presentation are licenses under what license. I have to say. So, unit testing. Let's talk about unit testing. I feel like a lot of people saw this picture or similar picture before. It's like a theory how you should supposed to do TCT. So you write some tests, you check that all the tests fail, then you write some code, then you check, or continue writing code until all the tests pass, then you uh, go to the first step. Who actually does that? <laughs> uh, yeah, the problem is nobody actually does it. What most people do, they do something like this. They write some code, um, they write some tests, they check if the test pass, if it's okay, they just write some more code. Who does it? Okay, sorry. sorry. I expected. Uh, yeah, uh, um, almost, I, I actually nobody, uh, never saw anybody doing the first TTD approach. Really, all my colleagues do this. Um, the problem is, this approach is inherently broken. Who can say why? I think the same guys who write the code should have the tests. Yeah. Because you're biased, you know, you know that's what's happening. So it has been not mm -hmm. usual. Yeah, there is some truth to that, but not right. Okay, um, so let's continue. I like to think about uh, software engineering is some kind of um, <coughs> application of uh, scientific method. So I see quite a lot of analogy here. So for example, a bug in a bug tracker is uh, like observation work. We see phenomena, we record everything we know, we put all the useful information. Um, some people don't do it, I get them. Like um, you close the bug, you fixed and it was like performance degradation of the nose of the picture happened. And in a half year it happens again. Not, not very good storage work. So debugging is actually a scientific process, like an inquiry. Um, when you uh, like create hypotheses and try to run experiments and check why things work that way. Um, but this bug fixer is actually a hypothesis, so you think, okay, this piece of code will change the system in a way that it behaves differently. A unit test is actually an experiment. So if we talk about experiments, let's just continue the analogy and talk about drug tests. So if you see a report, right? We took 50 people, they had, they had cold, and we let them uh, take drugs for two weeks every day. And two week, in two weeks, none of them had a call anymore. Maybe some of them died, I don't know. Does it sound right? Oh, what's wrong? Like, no, it doesn't. Because we never know what would happen if we never took the drug. We need both, um, like, placebo and, and the drug to compare. And with unit testing, it's the same. If you just write code and then test, you, you never test it. You never check that your test fails on a not, not working code. It's like it's the same thing. So, but I also have this problem of uh, writing implementation first. So my workflow is a bit convoluted. So I write some code, then I test, write some tests. Usually they pass. I was like, what the fuck? Like, why do they pass? I mean, I write in C++, it, it can't work first time. So I revert, I revert my code, I check that the test actually fails, sometimes it doesn't. And then I'm like, whoa, something is wrong. Then I 
redo the code again and check the text. Okay, now I'm, I'm kind of sure that it works. I mean, you see that the first scenario is much shorter and cleaner and it's better to follow it, but if you trap in, 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 in here, it's what I usually do. Yeah, so. The, the word to code, I, um, how exactly do you do that? Because the sort of, if, if you were too much, like you, you dropped implementation, it's just put in and assert falls, not implemented. It's obvious that the test will fail. But what you really sort of want to have is that the test catch the, the subtle implementation mistakes, like an off by one error. Yeah, so one, um, usually I do it when I fix bugs. So I kind of write a fix for a bug, then I write the test. Oh, I should have done it the opposite way. So I revert the code. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. If, if you already wrote an implementation, it's kind of hard. I usually go and just break something in the implementation. So you know, there is a such thing as a, a mutation testing testing when there is a program which tries to mutate your code randomly so it still compiles, but um, if your test still passes, it's kind of uh, occupied with something fixed. Um, there's a tool we really need, but yeah, most of us don't, don't use it, so I have to do it like that. So, why is this happening? Why people don't use the first nice clean approach and use uh, the convoluted path or just the wrong one? So, I believe that it's just because it's much easier to write implementation first. You have some ideas in mind, you just write them down, and well, you don't even know how the interface will look like. Um, it, it, it's, it's like, um, yeah, it's just much easier. And um, another thing is uh, it's confirmation bias. So there is a funny article in New York Times. I will send you the PDF uh, so you, you can click the link afterwards. Um, and people really don't like to hear you're wrong. So the article basically displays you the sequence and you have to guess the rule. And you can type in numbers and check for your hypothesis holds. And most of the time, you just pick the, the most obvious answer, which won't ever show you that uh, you're wrong. So you usually guess the wrong sequence, the wrong rule for the sequence, just because you, you didn't want to hear you're wrong. Um, and the second uh, problem is that uh, error messages suck. They're really up. I mean, they're really famous. So, <coughs> regarding the first one, um, it seems to me that it's, it's slightly kind of um, a bit too simple. I often feel that, for instance, if I had a bug, the first step would be for me to reproduce it, right? And that would be, for instance, with a test. Um, but on the other hand, you know, when I'm kind of in this exploratory mode, when I don't actually know exactly what's the right interface to use, right? It's much easier and more convenient to start writing code and see how things fit together and only then you go go with testing. Um, actually testing can help you in this case too because you can actually start writing usage of your API. You can say, okay, what code I want to be able to write. You, you don't write the whole implementation first. You just, you just okay, what I want to be able to write. And often for me, I started to write implementation, and then I go to a test, and I see that API is actually bad. It's not convenient to use in, in tests, so it's not convenient to use in real code. So I have to go back and rewrite the code again, so the tests look nice. Right, but at the end of the day, you are doing some kind of research process, right? And yeah. you will change things. So I think it also depends on the what are you working on? Are you working on a library that's going to be widely used? Or are you, you know, tied into the gigs with some I mean, Even though if you fix parts, it's still much easier to just, you, you read the code and you see, ah, this, this thing is broken, that's why it's not working. So you just fix it right away. And then, oh, I need to write a test. And then you write the test afterwards. It's, it's still not, simpler. Yeah, I'm, I'm not disputing, I'm just saying that I think it's just, you know, simple kind of so, so I find your observation very interesting, Michal. Um, could it be that in some cases, you are tackling the problem where you don't really know whether the interface you come up with actually has an implementation. So you really sort of have that boundary of right. can you implement it? And then actually it's really inconvenient to specify the interface first because you don't know whether you have a sort of existential litmus. 
you rather have one witness and then you start twiddling it and see what interface is actually sort of in reach. Ah, okay. Okay, I agree. So, this is actually a message which I got from um, HTEC, which I use for unit testing to test my library. <laughs> actually, HTEC is not that bad. It actually highlights differences. So if you have really good eyes, you can see one green code on this slide. Yeah. Here it is. Great. Thank you. Or this one. So my library throws exceptions, and I want to check the message which uh, the exception contains matches some predicate. So if it fails, I see something like this. Predicate failed on exception, and I see all exception. Like, which predicate? Like, if you just see the message, you have no idea what went wrong. So, how can we alleviate the pain of um, the messages? So, in the first scenario, you can do something like GD for credit to, to write your own comparison function which gives you a nice tip if uh, there is a mismatch. Or you can use Hedgehog, which um, Simon was talking about uh, last time, and I actually never heard of it before, and I was really impressed by the quality of her messages. So it even uh, displayed a uh, gift for you if you use quality. Or you can use matchers, which is a slightly better approach in many cases because uh, it's not just the quality. You, if you want to write like predicate or something, it's much um, more convenient if you use the, the major API. Yeah. And um, it gives you ability to test not everything. Like um, at, at work, for example, I always um, check something specific. Like I don't care about the whole structure. I just want to be sure that error messages contain some number or they have like this string. I don't care about the whole error message. I mean I don't want to over specify like that. So what are matters? Um, I write C by day uh, and I have to write a lot of tests um, because it's C. So I will show you some examples and we'll explain how it works. So I hope if, if even if you don't know C, you will understand what is going on. So assume we have a we have a class which is a service and you can basically get users by ID. So status or is some kind of either when you have you can have like error or okay with with a value. So it's either like error or user. Um, so we want to test the implementation of our service. And um, we don't really care what user is. We just know that it contains ID and name. And the scenario we want to test is that when we ask service to give our, us a user by ID, the user object will have the exact same ID as we uh, gave the input, and that the name will be empty. So um, there are three important uh, in here. First, you have this expect that, uh, which is like bold red thing. It's a special macro which performs the whole assertion. So it takes the value and the matcher and it performs the assertion, like checks that the value satisfies the predicate uh, specified by the matcher. So, and uh, this is the value itself and this is the matcher. So, first thing is to say that the value uh, this this thing returns is okay. Like this this address. And inside of this okay, we have something for which all of the predicates hold. And uh, like first predicate is the property ID of user is equal to this user ID we passed. And property name of the user is not empty. I think it's pretty real. Um, so, um, what will happen if we forgot to populate uh, the name? 
uh, this is the actual error message produced by the Gmod library. Um, I just slightly reformatted it so it fits the slide nicely and it's easier to read. It says that this value, the service get user, expected in a K, um, and that um, this value inside of the K um, is an object whose given property we call to five. Five is a user again I passed to the library. And um, object whose given property is empty. It doesn't know the property names, unfortunately. So, and the actual was the K user ID is five, name is empty. The type which contains value, it's just the same value which is inside of a K and whose given property is empty string. I think it's pretty nice, much better than pretty K fail for value. So, we also want to test the error case. So when we when we give some inline ID, our service should return status which says uh, your user has been found, and uh, the error message will contain the ID of the user which wasn't found, which I care usually. So if I see the like error message in the log, I would like to see which user we tried to find. So. Again, this is the actual error message from the library. Um, so it's an error, um, and the space is generic, and status code is not found, and it has an error message that has some string minus one, which was invalid ID. And actual is generic, not found, on the not user, whose error message is wrong, which is pretty good. So we, we actually see the whole message and this message is wrong. The stuff is supposed to get. So I would like to implement something like this in Haskell. Uh, because I couldn't find anything like this in Haskell. And I'm used to the lectures um, library very much. So what requirements do I, uh, I have? Um, I kind of I find that the messages produced by the Jmoc library not perfect because you have to uh, really like read them carefully to understand what was wrong. I, I don't see like the whole picture, um, and I want to be able to um, play with the format, like um, change it over time, maybe to or or to pick the, the right format dynamically based on the which error message. Uh, do I have matchers or basically I want flexibility in output uh, because I don't know which which format will be the best one and uh, in, in the Gmoc library the format is basically fixed and you can change uh, the format without the right in the whole library I, I really don't like template Haskell so don't template Haskell today and um, I'm terrified by the um, Tendency of Haskell programmers of including like everything in uh, the dependency. I think they're just terrible, so I try to use minimal dependencies. So the main idea I have is basically what if we just represent the result of the mature execution as a tree, which basically reflects the the, the structure we compose them with, because you, you saw the C example, and it's basically a tree of uh, pretty case. So um, I, I will take the small piece from 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 the example. So I can have all of uh, it's one node of the tree which has two sub nodes. First sub node is protection ID. Protection is a fancy name I use instead of property. I will talk about that later. And this projection is equal to five. And it actually was five. And the projection name, uh, which was user name, is not empty, which is a failure because it was empty. So then we can store the whole structure as a, as a result of the much execution and then try to compose the message in the most meaningful way out of the whole tree. So uh, this is the first attempt. Uh, so I have the 
tree, uh, which contains result, description, which is a distinct uh, protection ID or object, um, value, which is a string representation of the value which was passed to the matcher, so I can see like at every step what was inside of this matcher. And the subtrees, which is if, if you have composite, like of of, yeah, it will contain a result for all the children. So the matcher is just a um, function from from a value to a match tree. So we give a value, it returns a match tree. Uh, we also need something like expect that, which takes a value, the matcher, and returns an assertion, uh, which is should match um, in my terminology because I use H stack and it had what should be, should not be, so should match from the team. And um, I also have a small helper function uh, predicate which turns like arbitrary predicate into a matcher if you specify the message you want to see in here. Uh, right? it's, it's pretty like a trivial function. So given this um, trivial first attempt, we can already do quite a lot of cool stuff. For example, uh, this is a, like the simplest matcher I can think of, this quality test. Uh, so you have a value, it, it takes a value and returns a matcher for uh, values of the same type. Uh, it uses the function which we saw on the previous slide and we pass equal x as a predicate and is a value equal to string representation of x. Um, as, a, as a message. Uh, it's equal to five. Um, so given this simple interface with predicate, we can easily implement a lot of useful measures like greater than, less than, greater or equal, uh, less or equal, Block approximately equal, which is a really cool matcher, which I spent a lot of time trying to implement. Uh, and we can already implement the, the same thing which we saw as a C example, is a property in the data. Uh, I call it projection so that it doesn't collide with quick check property because it creates a lot of confusion. Um, so, um, this is a much of combinator, which takes a message, which is the name of the projection function from something I call S to A, matcher for A, and returns matcher for S. So if you have like something big and a, a matcher for a small part of it, you can create matcher for the whole big thing using this function. Um, so one, um, of the use cases is uh, implementing matches for product types when you have like um, structure with multiple fields and you want to match some fields out of the product. So you can you can see like username is is one of the things we can already write. We take the matcher for a name. Um, we call the function projection specify which what is the name of the thing we are looking at. at. We call the user name, we pass the user name as a, as a projection. And check it. this is a matcher for the name. So what we say is, uh, basically what it does, we take a matcher for, for a string and return a matcher for the whole user. But we can use uh, the same function in many ways, like if we want to check the reminder of some value when you uh, take uh, divide or uh, model k uh, satisfy some predicate you can use projection so basically it's not only for product types you can you only use it by your imagination so one problem with projection well it's not really a problem it's just a curious fact that it does not satisfy the same law as country map so if you ever saw contravariant um, type class from a data functor contravariant, if 
has one method control map, which is like map, but works in the opposite direction. Um, it has some logs, like if you control map ID, it's the same thing as ID. I mean, in Haskell, you can compare functions for quality, right? So you can just say it's um, equivalent. And if you control map the function, it's the same thing as control map the same functions, but in a different direction, in a different order. So if you, if you look at projection, everything is broken, but for a reason. Because we, 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 these laws can be used for uh, optimization, for fusing stuff. If we want to prevent this, we want to actually capture the whole sequence of uh, calls, like all the, all, the, all the projections with all the intermediate values. And if you replace uh, this thing with this thing, you will lose the intermediate value. Um, and you not always go this direction because intermediate values can be not showable, for example. So this is an outlaw for for real. This is curious fact. So okay, um, I had some library of uh, matchers already, and I wanted to implement matchers for lists because I mean we use lists in Haskell all the time. So. Um, one matcher I have in mind is elements R, which takes list and um, which takes list of matchers and creates a matcher for a list. And for every element in the list, it calls the corresponding matcher. So for one, it calls this one, for two, it calls this one, for three, it calls this one. So, so far, so good. Unfortunately, it's not always that nice because if you have an empty list and no empty list of matchers, you don't have the A to pass to the, to the matcher. Um, so you can get the error message. So we have to rewrite the types, right? I mean, you can implement this matcher in our simple approach. And if you can have a value which is missing, well, just wrap things in maybe, right? So the new type is a bit more complicated to have. Uh, function from maybe a to much tree. So you can represent um, the fact that when you don't have a thing to match, you can still get the error message to display. Okay. Um, actually, with this type, you can, um, you already have enough power to implement elements R. I mean, I don't show implementations because they look terrible. It's quite a lot of code and it's boring, so I just Work on type level, it's much more fun. Uh, uh, so, this gives um, uh, other way to implement another combinator. I, I, it's just pop up suddenly, it's called prism, uh, because it reminds me of the prisms from a uh, lens library. So, it's almost the same as projection, like almost the same. The only difference is that we have maybe instead of thing here. So it kind of not always can extract the value from S. And the rest is exactly the same. And this thing gives you the power to, to build matchers for some types. So for example, if we have either, and we want to check that it's the right side of the either, here is the actual implementation. It's like actual implementation. So you just go prism the name of the prism which is right, and inside you have a small function to, to check whether it's uh, the right thing. And if it's right, you just return uh, the thing inside. If it's not right, okay, the uh, match failed. And um, it's not, we're not limited to, to either. We can use, uh, we can write matches for maybe, we can, Basically, if every type which you can write, you can represent it as a nested products and sums, like either's, and you have like five alternatives. You will have to write five matchers, but it's okay. It's not too bad. Yes. <laughs> Generic. Um, uh, so yeah, so far so good. Prisms are really cool, but um, 
and as I showed you in the second uh, example of um, error messages that suck, um, we can want to match exceptions. So can we do it? Let's check. So I want to be able to write code like this. I have an action, and I call my should match function. I have this fancy new combinator of rows, which takes a matcher for an exception and creates a matcher for an action. So we'll check that this action throws an exception, and this exception uh, successfully can be successfully matched with this matcher. Um, let's check what the type of rows is from this exception, uh, from this example. So um, E should be an exception. We have a matcher for E. We take maybe IO of A and return a string. Well, there is a problem here. In Haskell, you can only uh, catch exception in IO. You, even if it's a pure exception like R, you can you can catch it in pure code. So you have to escape to IO to catch something. And and here it's a pure value. So there is no way we are going to to implement this function because I mean we can't do IO without doing IO. So we have to revise types again. Mm. Okay, now I gave the the type a different name so it sounds more um, more clever. Uh, it's called matcher f because it takes extra argument f which should be at least a function of user. So and we thread this f uh, into a value inside of maybe and we have it on a match tree. So it's not just match tree, it's f match tree. So f has kind star star or type type in the modern Haskell. And we need another function, which is called should match IO, which takes IO action, match up for IO, and creates an assertion. With these types, we can actually implement probes. Um, so now, quiz. Why not this? Why is not F maybe A into F match A? Because if you don't have the result, yeah, um, so I, I think uh, he's right. So actions are just values in Haskell, right? So if we have something like this list with actions as evidence, such that first action throws exception one, second one throws exception two, if this thing is not represented, so we have to go this way, right? By the way, if you have any questions, just ask right away. So I'm not completely convinced of what I'm just not seeing because in the execution context you're you're at. In should you mean we we can put the logic here, right? Yeah. So this is what <coughs> each stack does. The problem is it's hard to, to do it, things like this. So it's not really composable because you need like a lot of Functions to run the matchers, which you, you don't, you can't pass everything into it. So you can have something like should throw or should throw an exception which matches matcher. Yeah, you can have like a special function, but then you can do this, for example. Um, you could do this, yeah, but I just find this this thing much more elegant because it composes better. Why do you call them maybe not to be that? Because uh, it's either there or, or it's not, so I, I could use either, but I don't know what to put on the left side. In a message? Error message. Mm, I mean, Otherwise I, I, I don't have it yet. I, I, I want to get it from, from the matcher. Error message. I don't have error message. I want to get it from the matcher. So if I don't have a value, I just say, okay, I don't have a value for you, so please fail and give me your message so that I can display it. You will still catch the, the inner and then it would end up in the match tree. I'm not yeah, sure what to say. Ah, what to say. Yeah. Yeah, we can talk about this later, if you can. Don't forget the question. 
So again, everything is good. We can we can catch exceptions with our complicated types. But um, I actually was really surprised by how hard it is to implement the, the negation. So if you have predicates, it's like very natural to have something like um, negate or like not. If you have a matcher which checks something, you want to be able to build a matcher which checks the opposite. Like if you want to check for equality, you want to check for not equality. It sounds reasonable. So it should be like a super trivial to implement it. You just uh, take matcher and turn matcher. Super simple. But how to do it? So my first attempt was to basically construct like a one level higher tree. So if, if you have negation of equal five, it will construct like if the value is equal to five, not if the value is equal to five. Uh, like it works. All, all looks good, right? Has drawbacks as usual. So first problem is uh, the, mares, the, the message is not fine, especially when you have multiple levels of, of, um, of matchers. So you don't know really what matcher you use returns. And you put not, and you can have like not, not something, or the message is like not is a value equal to five is not really good English. Um, so I just didn't really like this idea. And the second one, I mean, if you take not, it's an evolution. So if you take not, not something, it's the same thing you passed, right? So if you say negation of negation of ten, it's not the same thing as ten because it's will have three to two levels higher, which is like not really elegant. So I spent a lot of time thinking how to do it properly. And I borrowed the idea from the C++ library. Mm -hmm. Basically, every matcher will know which direction it works in. So we'll have two directions, like positive and negative. And we just pass the direction of extra argument to the matcher. Um, that's it. We will have a function which flips directions. So if it was positive, we will get negative. If it was negative, we will get positive. And the negation is actually implemented like this. It's like a code from the library. So with this code, negation of is actually uh, an evolution. So if you apply it twice, it will give you equivalent match. It won't construct the, the two L's of trees. And the good thing is, uh, error messages will look much better now because uh, every matcher will have to know how to construct a message for a negative case. It's uh, more work to implement like every single matcher, but it still works because error messages are better. Is not a value, is a value not equal to, to something, which is uh, not in the right place now. It's not somewhere here, it's right there. Um, yeah, so every matcher now, like almost every matcher now, um, have to know how to work in, in both directions. But there are some matchers which are polymorphic in, in direction, which is prism and property. So let's see how it works together. Um, I, I assume the same um, scenario we had before. So we have some service which users, uh, we can get user by ID, we can function, get user, takes a user service handle, user ID, and returns an action, which can return IO, uh, either string with an uh, error message of user, and user is just user ID and user name. Uh, it can have something else, but we don't care. And this is a metric equivalent to the C++ example. So we get user, plus service handle, plus user ID, it should match IO because we have IO here. Right is, which is right side of either, which we saw before, all of, and the list of matchers, projection user ID. Um, it's a name projection, this is just field from here, and this is a matcher for, for ID, it should be equal to this user ID. 
and projection in your name. This is just a function, this function from um, user to string, and it should be empty. It's not empty. I have a question relative to the uh, name of write is so if I understand this thing, I don't understand this matcher only triggers um, if the right doesn't match this, but if it's a left, then everything will be okay. Um, no, if it's left, then it fails. Yeah. Um, if I compare it to is not empty, like how you use the English there, okay. then I would expect the name is right. Is it really? Is right and is very empty? Yeah, or yeah, is, is right like? Okay, I mean the library is not public yet, so like. I can change the name if you want. I don't think you implement it yet, right? Can you implement it's it like it's it's a, this one here yeah, aside? Yeah, yeah. It will also make sense. It, 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 it's okay if it's left. No, I agree with you. I think um, name wise, that's a little better. No, no, Maybe it's more. Yeah. yeah. It is right, 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 Give us the right combinators. Over to the sheet. Is right. Yeah, maybe I should call it is right. But it's just is right. Oh, yeah. All right, this works with the right. Yeah, yeah. I thought you, you were discussing is not empty because is not empty is something different. Yeah, because here uh, is in the front, <coughs> here okay, is okay. in the air. Uh -huh. So, uh -huh. okay, I will here. Yes. Yeah, it's definitely not just a good suggestion. Is yes. right with? So you can really say, you want to write something all of. Yes. Oh. Right. Actually, I think C also uses like variant with. Mm -hmm. Yes. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Just right with. with. Actually, uh, making this presentation was really helpful for the design of the library because <laughs> <laughs> if something looked bad in slides, I just go and change it like, right away because, I mean, it's simpler mm -hmm. to, to just change the code than just uh, explaining what it looks like. Mm -hmm. so this presentation is a way easy unit test. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so here is an actual error message I, I produced for the library. Um, it's First, it's a bit hard to understand, but mm -hmm. with me. so first you can see that like there is a big cross, and it's, it fails, right? And if you just look at the crosses, you can see which parts of, of the whole structure fail. So um, this arrow separates the, the description of the matcher from the value, and if you see a value with angle brackets, it means that the, the Value was quite long, so it doesn't make any sense to just print it right away. And I create a reference to it here. Um, and it also makes the duplication, so you can see it's the same thing was passed to this projection and to this projection, so you don't have the screen printed with the same strings. Why not use brackets? Sorry, why not use yeah, like you know, like references, like in the in the in the book? Good question, because it looks like this. Yeah, but. So you can tell whether it's like a list with uh, one inside or is it a reference in, 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 in here. And yeah, these brackets don't be, are not used to um, more what if, what if you move them to the front, let's say, so they would be all on the left, so you would know what to expect. Like if you use, let's say, uh, because rather than having them on the right, you would have them all on the left, and then you would know that the, 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 the bracket on the left is not a list, it's actually a reference. Um, I don't know. I think if I understood you correctly, you would actually print the values instead of the. No, 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 right? no. It's, it's if very it's very short easy. enough. Yes, if it's short enough, I just right. print so it's value. Print it. And uh, yeah. So you would need to only what, move the references to the left, but well, keep well, the values well, in the right. Maybe they, uh, basically, basically, the, the, these kind of the angle brackets. I think they kind of if you have them like the, the way they are known in literature, then you kind of you look at it and then you you kind of visually you know right away. Okay, it's like where and then you know. Like yeah, like the food my, food my food first food. idea was to use brackets, but then I realized that it conflicts with this containing just one item, one, or one item, two, so. Yeah, but, well, okay. I think it's very easy to learn. Is this one? Right, right, right. And maybe I can use some fancy, like, uh, Unicode brackets, I don't know, I really like Unicode. <laughs> 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 but but you said that, you said that the, this library allows the user to actually format it, is it? The way that I like it, is it? I thought. 
I mean, it should allow me, uh -huh. me as a designer of the library, to change the format okay. in, in, uh -huh. without rewriting the whole thing. Okay. But for the, for the user of the library, it would not be possible to change the format, no? It is possible because uh -huh. all the gaps are exploited, so you can just combine the, the like the function should match eventually a really small one line of code, you just fuse everything together. And you can still uh, get access to the whole tree, so if you want to reformat it, you, you have like everything. And it's also exported, yeah. So it's not hidden in the internal. No? Yeah, it's That's everything is exported so far. Um, okay, so you see that immediately that this part succeeds, so you don't even have to look at it, so you just need to look at the error path, and you can see, okay, the projection user name um, should, should be not empty, but it was. And you can still examine the whole user, because it, I think it's really important to be able to examine the whole context. Um, like, because uh, if you see, if, if you if you use the predicates with just should be from edge tag, you can always put uh, pre like function to extract something on the left. Like uh, uh, user user name of the user should be something, but then you lose the whole user. You can't inspect the whole layer whole context, which can be really important. Like, for example, if it was an exception, like an error, left side, you would see it on the left side as well. But and, and you won't have, you, like all these parts will be empty, basically. You, no, no inputs, um, no values, but you, you can still see their rest. Did you consider deduplicating the reference themselves? So reference number one actually has a copy of reference number two in there. The whole user. It would be really nice, but uh, for with the current design, it's not possible. Because uh, I mean, I'm thinking. I, I, I can do it string like, based. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I can <laughs> I can do it string, uh, but but what if it's inside of strings? Like it contains a. If the, if the result is really long, like, uh, you know, some of the values could be you know, really long, you know, so why not save them as separate files and then you can use some nice commercial div tool and, and then it's, it's really easy to spot. You we can know. even start it for you with the sub-process, right? You can just pass the right values to your div tool and so you can see the divs. Oh, yeah, oh, by the way, yeah, yeah. Well, there are two, yeah, you can you can keep kind of more than two. What happened like you know, in the HTML page? Yes, one problem I have with, with um, um, terminal emulators is that I can can do a lot of cool stuff. Like like I could, for example, highlight uh, display tooltips if you if you hover here, right? Like so that you don't have to look through its number anywhere. So yeah, I'm thinking about how to how to explore more portals, but I'm just not sure how to integrate with the. the Frameworks. And you want to put the layout so that it's going to be, again, the full generality of the tool. Obviously, right now, the, the prisms that you're doing are very simple, the projections that you're doing are very simple, but what if someone's actually transforming their output, or like there are circumstances where two things look the same, but they're actually not the same value semantically? You can, well, if, if assuming that, in other words, assuming that everything is just a hierarchical tree structure where nodes are repeated is not necessarily robust across all possible uses of the library. Well, it's a little bit more extreme than what you see. Uh, uh, <laughs> I would say that it would be nice to be able to pass arguments and pick like what they want. So, for example, you can specify which length you consider too long. For now, it's just hard for the 20 characters, but I mean, it could be like an environment variable or something like that. Yeah, plus, I mean, there can be many runners, uh, so mm -hmm. I, I think this really depends on the context that you And I agree with what you said, that this is not necessarily robust, but what I've observed in our testing um, areas is that typically you get too much output. So if you have tools that really help you focus quickly, mm -hmm. um, you have to understand how to do it. I mean, if you understand, yes, it's a screen based matching, you will still be able sort of to expand from your head. And it's less code, so typically better. 
Yeah, so I decided to go correct first and then I need to add some heuristics, so it should be correct most of the time. Um, but yeah, uh, it's a great idea to, to, to replace these things with these preferences. Just I need to make them visually distinct as well. So you can say it's actually a reference in here, it's not like part of the string. But it highlights an interesting problem because actually the outer test sort of succeeded because you have a right value. It's just that no, no, it, it actually value. fails. So the, 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 the right is yeah. fails if it's left, or if um, the value inside of right yeah. does not satisfy the predicate. Yeah, yeah. yeah true. So it's looking some conjunction, right? Essentially. Oh, you, by you, the way, one, one, one cool right. thing I forgot to, to, to talk about. Mm -hmm. If we just go to the very first definition of much tree, um, do you see this exclamation mark? Do you know why we put exclamation mark into the structure? Okay, there are beginners. So exclamation mark means all these related things tricky. So it will be like real bool. Not real like a C++, pointer to real bool. And these things are lazy. So the cool part is we use the Haskell laziness. So if the test actually passes, we never construct these huge error uh, messages. We don't do any like reference count or nothing. It's just or everything is lazy here. So most of the time the test should pass because it runs on CI or something like this. So you debug it once, it should always work. And we won't spend cycles um, constructing these messages with C++. But why would you necessarily need the band? I agree it's a good performance optimization, but it's there. I mean, it's the right? Yeah. Um, because laziness still works. I mean, if you just pull in the boolean value and you test that. Yeah, that's true, but um, I'd still like to, to, to specify explicitly that for the compiler. I, I will always expect, uh, I, I will also always take a look at this result. Because, I mean, if I execute much error, I will always be looking at it, right? I need to know whether it just fails or not. So I could leave it out, but then I will probably have a, some structure functions like like a func. So yeah, I think it's a good reflex. Just to, to if you have something small like bool, just to keep it strict. So usually there's such a turn it around with this stuff like, look, there's actually not bands on everything, which should be the default when you write the code. And these bands, these three fields are explicitly lazy, but we want to exploit the laziness. Yeah, this would be a great uh, default for Haskell. Uh, I, I would really like to have lazy as a like, type of notation, to be honest. Type of notation is pretty difficult. I mean, like lazy message, but like lazy. Yeah, you can, so there's two extensions. Um, there's uh, strict talk. Strict Haskell, and there's strict data, strict which does the default, you just have. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's just mostly reflex. When I see something small, it should be tricky, right? Uh, so let's go. Yeah. So, oh, no. what's next? The first thing is publish and hackage. Um, um, it's work in progress because I have to get approval from my employer. It's not that simple. I spent already like a month trying to get approval. Yeah, it's, but as soon as I got one, it's a hack, so you can use it. Uh, better error messages. I really care about them. It's mostly the whole library is error message driven. Just see how it looks like now. Refactor things. Um, more combinators. Um, I already have quite a lot, but I would like to have more for uh, standard library types, so to construct them manually. Um, I would really want to have something extra for debugging, like structured diffs, uh, like hash for that. So where you can see that this value is not equal to this, I can also display the actual diff um, for, for non-equality. And every matcher can check 
like decide what can be extra debug information, and so you can inspect uh, like debug things in the radio. Um, uh, I will say that I have quite a lot of ideas which intersect with control lens library. Maybe you can use lenses and uh, prisms for from control lens as a some sort of matchers. Uh, it's a fine matchers given the name. Uh, I'm not that good at lenses yet, so I need to investigate a bit to understand how to integrate things properly. And uh, another thing which I spent quite a lot of time looking at is how to generate these matchers automatically for EDTs. So if you have like a tree, you want to be able to get matchers for like, is it a leaf, is it a fork, and like construct matcher for a tree given like uh, matchers for company. Uh, I'm pretty sure it should be possible to implement it in generics. I spent some time with GHC generics. Um, it was challenging. <laughs> um, maybe I should uh, take a look at the um, generic salt, yeah, something like this, which gives you a better structure. So actually, it's not the whole library. There's a lot of cool stuff which I didn't talk about just because I already have like four slides. Um, like, for example, how to build matchers for user-defined types. I, I recommended this pretty well in, in the library, so I'm not happy if you can you can check it out. And yeah, uh, I, I really care about documentation. So, and uh, so, summary of the talk. Uh, so if you remember anything from the talk, it should be the first line. So make sure <laughs> your test fail when the code is broken and succeeds uh, when you have a correct one. So there should be at least two, two test cases. One you can pass, one you fail, or it's not the same thing? No, it's more like you should first check if your test fail. The same test. Yeah, right. the same test. We don't. We should not modify the test. That's also important. Mm -hmm. And then you check the, the fix the implementation and we check that the same test passes. Mm -hmm. I actually had a problem recently. It was really funny. So I was writing some TypeScript and I wrote the implementation for for like web component. I, I checked in the UI if it worked. I started to write tests. It was a nightmare. Oh, nothing worked. I spent like a lot of time trying to fix tests. And then they passed. I was like, whoa, finally, it works. And then I, like, in a couple of months, I touched it again. I wrote a new test following the like, TDD approach. It also passed without any changes. Like, I, I didn't even implement it with a thing, but all the tests passed. So it turned out, wh while I was tweaking the, the test suite, I actually broke it in a way that makes all the tests pass all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Because of some like like JavaScript promise thingy magic, I don't know. So it's really important. I mean, I, I step on this like every month at least once. So, um, so second summary is yeah, it's possible to make error messages much better than they are now. Because when I started to, to do stuff in Haskell, I was really frustrated. Like why C++ is like much better unit testing operating engine than Haskell? Doesn't make any sense. And uh, the library will be called Test Matchers. And it's, going to go, uh, it's coming soon, I hope. So I will send uh, you uh, like a link to the link. So yeah, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please. <laughs>
to a certain sense to me it's I mean, it's obvious that everything below fails if the one above didn't get, get the right yes. input. Yeah. So if again, I, I'm coming from this perspective of how can I make it such that if I get a test failure, the reaction is as quick as possible. So I mean, if it's a left that I get there, I should really just fix sort of getting a right. And if afterwards the right still has the shape, wrong shape, then I want to get more detail. So, so my expectation would actually be there that we, we drop the stuff below. Because it's only nuts. It's, it's all going to be right. Not really. I, I don't think so. Because I, I, my point is, I should be able to understand what's wrong, what, what the code was expecting, and what went wrong, without looking at actual code. I should just, I open test and CI, I see, okay, the, we were checking this scenario, but we got this error. And then I can jump to the code and see what happened. So one test can actually cover many different cases, and uh, it will be fact in the same in one running one test. Yeah. You can see a number of you know some of the, some of things work, some things didn't, but you don't have to split them out in separate tests. Yeah? Kind of one test. No. You, you're still encouraged to write smaller tests. Yes, the definitely. thing is, you, you you can only test things you care about. Mm -hmm. It's very important. Like you care only about like some substrings in the error message. So you can put it here. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's actually, if, if you compare for equality, you have this tendency of writing big tests because it's really cumbersome to type in all, all the information which you expect. For, for example, I was writing parser in like, lecture in, in Haskell. Mm -hmm. And I was tracking the positions. Um, so I have this function, lex. I give it the string, I get a sequence of tokens. I don't care about, like, where this token is in the input. I hope Alex library can figure out where we are. I just care tokens are of the right type. But I still want to be able to see the, the, the like, offset, all the details if it fails. So this was one of my iterating you know, use cases. So if I have like a big data structure which contains a lot of details, but I don't care about most of them, just like that the tokens are the right type. Mm -hmm. uh, I should be able to test it, but if it fails, I get all the details. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, I think, a good way of quickly describing the, what, I don't know exactly what you're saying. Simon. What Simon's saying, um, which is that really write or write with or whatever you name it is actually itself two assertions. And the first one is check eager, the first one is check first and then we short circuit on the second one, really. Because the first assertion is it's right and not left. Okay. And the value has the following properties, right? And there's certain types of assertions which, where you want short circuiting behavior essentially. This is an example of one of them, right? You have a right value that has the following characteristics. If you have the left value, the fact that it doesn't have the following characteristics is not interesting information to the developer because it could be, it's the wrong shape. Uh, well, I think then it's still have freedom, the users still have freedom to, to, com yeah, to, right. combine, to combine matters in a way that they would see what they need, as in like what's important to them. No, I, I think, but in this case, I don't know if they do have that freedom because you don't have the freedom to make yeah, yeah, a short circuiting, uh, a short circuiting matcher or like two, a matcher containing two things. The first of which failing will nix the second of which being tested. Yeah, good point. I can have two two basically combinators. One behaves like a short circuit. One is normally a free. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, in, if I had a HTML, I could just collapse these things up magically in a tree if uh, like there is nothing in here so some but you could still like expand everything and if you are curious yeah. might also be interesting actually to consider whether there are cases where short circuiting would be helpful if you have to like, them all off and if a list of assertions and you might always say well I'm really testing in sequence and if one of them fails it's very clear that everything else cannot succeed in any case 
So sort of, it's it's about guiding the user, uh, like test failure. Okay, what should we focus on fixing? But I also have to say, I mean, you have to experience with with this uh, using this framework. So if you find like, well, always seeing the full test description, actually is is not a not a problem. Well, I mean, you saw the C plus plus case. It can be quite long and exaggerated. So my first idea was to make it more structural, so you can skip quickly. Uh, something like a local level, as in like bare bones. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Pass something like that, like like a local level. It's local level. It's it's really uh, so. Whether you can show when a short circuit thing makes sense. Thanks for that concept. Is is really something that. Uh, the, the writer of the library, or in some cases, the writer of the test, has to care about. So it's 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 a decision that needs to be made. And then I think the other thing is really pointing to <laughs> you should have HTML as output. Yeah. It would solve a lot of problems. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Yep. Uh, I think you were wondering if you can. Strictly evaluate every argument, and I think like uh, you can just use bank at ends for that. So you can annotate uh, arguments with a bank, uh, like an exclamation mark, and then it will uh, get evaluated. You mean the in a tree, right? No, no. Um, like when you were talking about brick, yeah, here. And um, if you write a function, you can um, annotate the argument. Yeah, yeah, I know. I mean, here it will be automatically tricked everywhere you use. And if you actually like call the should match function, it will always evaluate stuff to check which path to take. So you don't even need to get back to the part here because I mean, GHC will figure it out. So. It just depends where you want to put it. Okay. Yeah. I no, I thought you wanted to put it there. So. Yeah. Yeah. Find this way. If, if you take a look at the code written by him, yeah, it, it spans like everywhere. I kind of was conscious because I was optimizing some hospital for that six point. It, it's really amazing how much performance you can squeeze just by randomly putting. <laughs> <laughs> Fans here and there, it's like, oh, it's five times faster. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.